Let's try that again. Good morning. Well, thank you for your patience. What a wonderful job the worship team has led us in this morning. Uh, yeah, let's, let's thank them. Appreciate that. And... While you're applauding, would you stand with me in honor of reading God's Word? We're going to read the passage today. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If you have one of our pew Bibles here, if you don't have a Bible, you want to reach there in the seat in front of you. We're on page number 1,442. You can follow along. It says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning at verse 16. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Father, I pray you might speak to us through your word today. You might encourage us, remind us, and point us in the direction of representing Jesus and his kingdom well. For it's in Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. So this passage is, of course, written by Paul to Christians at a place called Corinth. And they were at a pretty tumultuous and turbulent time. We might find ourselves in a remarkably tumultuous and turbulent time. For most of us, this is the most culturally turbulent time in our lifetime. Now, that doesn't mean for everybody. But for our shared experience in the place we live today, this is probably the most tumultuous and turbulent time we've walked through. Uh, David Brooks, in an article in The Atlantic, wrote that every 60 years, America seems to go through a moral convulsion. We sort of turn on one another, look to one another, and say, man, I don't believe you. I don't want to be in community with you. I want to reject the things that you believe, and we feel that as well. I took that article, I actually interviewed David about this, and I, I kind of applied this to the church in a magazine that I serve as the editor-in-chief of, Outreach Magazine, and I called it a cultural convulsion. And it's not just an American experience. Matter of fact, the next week at this time, I'll be starting a class the next day at teaching at Oxford, and while I'm there, I'll actually begin with unpacking some of the cultural convulsion that people are experiencing in the UK. And for those of you in a multinational, multi-ethnic, and multicultural church like this one, you know that that's the reality in Brazil and the Philippines, it's the reality in Angola, it's the reality around the world. We feel that we're in a unique time of cultural convulsion. A few years ago, 2016, I sat down with my publisher about writing a new book. And I had just signed a contract with the publisher and uh, it might be surprised to you that not everyone knows what they should write on when they meet, so the publisher and I had a meeting and they came forward with a suggestion. They said, why don't you write a book on outrage? It was 2016, it was in the midst of a presidential election, everybody was mad, outrage, there's a lot of division, and, and they said, why don't you write a book on outrage? And I said to them, I said, well, you know, it'll take me a year to actually go through the process. I'll have to, have to write the book, and then the book will have to be edited, and then it'll go through process, and, and then it takes about a, a year, once it's written, to go through the processes of getting into publishing and stores, and I, and I said to them, I'm not sure people are still gonna be outraged in 2018. <laughs> Needless to say, they knew better, we wrote the book, and the reality is we're still walking through times of division. Matter of fact, I actually think that an honest look at the next few months and years probably means that it's gonna get worse before it gets better. Now, I don't know that for sure, I'm not a prophet, I'm not the son of a prophet, and I actually work at a nonprofit organization. So the question then becomes is, how might we as followers of Jesus represent Jesus and his kingdom in the midst of these turbulent and tumultuous times? I'd like to walk you through this passage and draw four things from this passage. If you wanna take notes, it's easy to follow along. We're gonna look at the passage and seek to apply it to our situation today. We're gonna to look back to what the text says, we're gonna look at universal underlying principles, and then we're gonna ask how might we represent Jesus and his kingdom individually and congregationally at Lake Avenue Church. 
And let me just say to you, if you're watching online, we are so glad that you are. We wanna say to you that you join in Jesus' mission there as well. If you're here in person, we together individually join Jesus on mission. We join in missional communities by zones to express that mission. We do so individually and congregationally. So four things I said, let's walk through some of those things together. If you're a note taker, number one on our outline is we get a new perspective. We get a new way of looking at the world and people because of our new life in Christ. The passage says this, so from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. In other words, we don't see people the way the world would want us to see people. We live in a world today where the way people see others is increasingly shaped by the kind of media that they consume, the kind of conversations that they have. As a matter of fact, far too many people today, Christians included, are being discipled by their cable news choices. They're being spiritually shaped by their social media and the end result is they're not seeing people through the gospel lenses that Paul writes of here. He says, so from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. We've got a new life now, a new way of looking at others, a new set of gospel lenses through which we see the world. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. It appears, we don't know the details, that the church here was misunderstanding who Jesus was, but now they see him more rightly. Now, but then it says this, it says therefore. Now, whenever you're reading through the Bible and there's a therefore, you wanna ask, what's it there for? What's it doing? What's it linking together? Well, it says this, therefore, and I bet it's a verse that you're familiar with if you've been in church for a while. It says, therefore, if anyone's in Christ, I have it memorized in a little different translation, but it said, if anyone's in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. And that's one of those verses that people put on coffee cups, people put on plaques and have in their home. I bet some of you have that verse here memorized. Would you mind telling me if you do? How many of you have that verse here memorized? Raise all kinds of people do, sure. So we know that as a follower of Jesus, being a Christian, matter of fact, if you're here today and you weren't sure and you're a guest today at Lake Avenue, we want you to know that the Christian life is not about you turning over a new leaf, it's about you receiving new life. New life in Christ that changes us, so we receive a new life. That new life, though, by the therefore, is connected to a new way of looking, a new set of lenses through which we see the world. So in this passage, it starts with the way we look at others. We no longer see anyone from a worldly point of view. We've got a a new way of looking, a new set of gospel lenses through which we see the world. It's connected to a new life in Christ, right? There's, therefore, there's new creation. The new creation has come. So I wanna put this together, this connection, right? We've got a new life, a new way of looking, a new set of lenses through which we see the world. You've seen me touch my glasses a few times, speaking of that new set of lenses lenses. I see lots of people wearing glasses out there. Raise your hand if you're wearing glasses. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Yeah. I'm not going to call you four eyes. Um, I just did, didn't I? So I remember when I was a kid, my, I came home. I grew up uh, just outside of New York City. And, and I remember my mom coming home to me and she said, we had just gone to the eye doctor. I'm not sure if it was immediately that day or prior. Maybe she worked up to bring me the news. She said to me, Eddie, she called me Eddie and, and you may not. She said, Eddie, <laughs> you're going to get to wear glasses, she said to me. And she said it in a positive way, as if I was going to get to go to get some ice cream that day. And, and I said, Mom, I was horrified by the idea of wearing glasses. Little Eddie Stetzer wearing glasses. Everyone would make fun of me. And she said, Eddie, they're not going to make fun of you. And I, I said, Mom, they are. She said, no, they're not. And I think that was the first day that I realized my mother didn't always tell me the truth because they did indeed make fun of me, but there was more. She said, Eddie, it's not just you're gonna get to wear glasses, Um, you're gonna get to wear an eye patch. The eye patch is for what they called back then, lazy eye. And I said, Mom, they're gonna be merciless. She said, Eddie, they're gonna think you're a pirate. (laughs) Narrator, they did not actually think I was a pirate. So I remember that experience when my youngest daughter, I have three amazing daughters, and uh, one of them was just left her house yesterday. She's a student at Biola University. Uh, It was a little bit of a news to her when I announced that I was the new dean at Biola University, but (laughs) she's adjusted to that reality um, eventually. But anyway, when when she was in middle school, she came home 
And Donna is my wife. Donna is my amazing wife. And Donna came up to me and she put her hand on my arm. And that's a signal in our marriage to pay attention, not implying that I struggle paying attention. But she put her hand on my arm and she said, Ed, uh, Caitlin is going to be getting glasses. I don't want you to overreact about this. I'm like, overreact? Me? So I stepped into dad mode. I don't know if you're familiar with dad mode. But I stepped into dad mode. I walked into the other room. Caitlin was a middle schooler at the time, and now she's a student. So it was a, a student at Biola. So it was a while ago. So she, um, I stepped in the other room, and I said, Caitlin. And without even thinking, I heard the words coming out of my mouth. And I said, Caitlin, I hear you're going to get to wear glasses. It appears I've turned into my mother. Um, and she saw right through me, actually. She, she's not allowed at this point to roll her eyes at her parents as a middle schooler, not saying that that might be a common thing for middle schoolers to their parents. So she, um, but she has the ability to sort of roll her eyes verbally without her eyes moving an inch. So, so she says, Dad, which is the eye roll without movement, she says, Dad, listen, I, get, don't, I know what you're doing, Dad. Don't worry. Like, kids today, they like wearing glasses. She said, Dad, my friends are going to the store, and they're buying glasses without prescriptions because they're stylish, and they want to wear glasses. And some of you are nodding head. You knew this. I didn't know this. And so I was so excited for her at that moment, but still simultaneously bitter about my own childhood experience. Because I explained to her, Caitlin, I don't wear glasses for fashion. Are you ready? I wear glasses for, wait for it, seeing. And when I don't have my glasses on, I can't see particularly well. I don't know if you're here or not, but I'm glad that probably you still are. And I put them on, I can see. And matter of fact, when they slide down my nose, actually the focal length is off and I have to readjust them to see. And that became an issue that led to a complaint one day. So for, I, I lived in Chicago, you graciously mentioned I served at the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center for, for seven years, and for four of those seven years, I was the interim pastor of a church in Chicago called the Moody Church. Some of you, may, have you ever been to the Moody Church? Any visited the Moody Church? A few of you, yeah, it's a beautiful church, it's kind of an historic church, not kind of, it's an historic church in downtown Chicago. My, my youngest daughter was always amused by the name the Moody Church. She said, are they happy some Sundays and unhappy other Sundays? This moody, I said, no, no, it's named after some famous person that I explained to her. But So I was the interim pastor there, and it's an historic church like this church is an historic church. It's a, it's a church that's done just bizarrely impactful things like this church has done. And I was the interim for four years. Nobody should be the interim of anything for four years. I was the interim pastor of Moody Church for longer than four of their actual pastors were the actual pastor of that church. So the first six months, they asked me to fill in. I didn't make any changes, but then they asked me to stay another six months and then a year, and I said, well, maybe we should just maybe make some changes so that if the new pastor wanted to come in and try some different things, I would have maybe opened the door. So, so we, uh, for example, we, we had a very large wooden pulpit, and I, I said, let me use a table for a while. We can go back to it, the big pulpit, when we want, when we're done. And, and it was a wonderful church filled with encouraging people, but also, too, people watch this church around the world. Moody Church has been attended by people that, that are now uh, living in places around the world. They're still watching, and not everybody was happy with some of the changes that we made at this historic church. Now, I'm sure none of you have experienced any of that in your own journey at a church, but some were unhappy. And sometimes they'd send in a letter. Now, don't misunderstand. We had a wonderful time, wonderful journey, four years. It was a great journey. But I received one day the greatest complaint letter in the history of complaint letters. It had to do with what I just shared with you. But I actually, so here, I got this in my email on my phone. And I took my phone at the time, and I, I screenshot this email. I kind of cut out the top part where he said, dear, dear pastor, and I had a nice intro. I want you to know it was a nice letter. He signed the name to his letter. But the heart of the letter is so good, I want to share it with you. Are you ready? Let's take a look together. Here it is on the screen. I'm going to read it to you. It says, I listened to your August 13th sermon at Moody Church Online. He lived in another state. He said, after listening to it once, I listened again. Praise God, what a level of study. Uh, because I was awestruck. He appears to have loved the sermon, 
awestruck with the number of times you adjusted your glasses while preaching. <laughs> so the second time I listened, I wonder what did he listen, three or four, I don't know. So the second time I listened, I saw in the first 36 minutes of your sermon, some of you are right now alarmed by the phrase, first 36 minutes of your sermon. It's Moody Church, a little different, stay with me. I saw you adjust your glasses 74 times. You can hear his passion. And then you took them off, so I counted no further. He goes to get a calculator. This was an average of once every 30 seconds, but you can hear his passion. But keep in mind, this was an incomplete count because some of the time scripture or your sermon was on the screen and I could not see you. <laughs> can you feel the man's passion for this? I tell you this in Christian love. <laughs> they all say that, even the really mean ones. Um, but this was not. I made changes on the basis of this. I tell you this in Christian love because I know you're interested in being aware of anything that may distract listeners from hearing what you're preaching and teaching. So I hope, he wrote with passion, you will accept this knowing that I want your ministry to be as effective for Christ as possible. I don't wear glasses for fashion, I wear glasses for seeing. And when I talk and get excited, my head moves around. When my head moves around, my glasses move around and I have to adjust them so that I can see. Now, why does this matter? Because the scripture tells us that we've got a new life, it's connected to a new way of looking, a new set of gospel lenses through which we see the world. The cultural moment is something unlike anything we've experienced in most of our lifetime. And so if the last few years you have felt your life, your relationships, and your church has been jostled about in the tumult and the turbulence of this cultural convulsion, could it be also likely that those gospel lenses, how you're supposed to see others, may have gotten jostled about as well? And what a great opportunity for us to readjust them and say, together we're going to represent Jesus and his kingdom well. So we get a, we get a, a new perspective because I've got a new life. I've got a new way of looking, a new set of gospel lenses through which I see the world. That's number one. Number two on our outline is we're sent on a mission of reconciliation. It says this in the next part, all this is from God. So it's actually referring to what is prior and, well, far beyond just the few verses we read. But then it goes into a discussion of reconciliation. And the, God, the writer here, Paul, is making a point and he's using something called parallelism. And parallelism is when he says something almost the same twice, but enough difference that you notice. If you're reading this passage in front of a group of people, you might say, did I just reread the same line? But let's listen to what he does and hear the word reconcile, how often it's used. It says, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So you can see that there's a progression clearly here that somebody has brought the message of reconciliation to somebody else. You can see that the message of reconciliation has been received. It says, who reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. It's a forward-looking idea here. We've been reconciled, now we've been given the message of reconciliation. We've been reconciled, now we've received the ministry of reconciliation. If you're a follower of Jesus, you've been reconciled by God through Jesus' death on the cross for our sin and in our place, and now you've been reconciled by God and given the ministry and the message of reconciliation. Matter of fact, you can trace that back for 2,000 years. Somebody told you, somebody told that person, somebody told that person, somebody told that, 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 all the way back till when Jesus said to his disciples, go make disciples of all nations. And they told somebody, and they told somebody, and somebody told somebody who told you. Now, I don't want you to miss that, right? Because when it says this picture, it's a reminder that we ourselves, we live on a, on a Great Commission highway that goes back 2,000 years. Our lives and our church are 
really just inheritors of this Great Commission Highway. Now that I live in California, I, I, uh, have you already heard, I, I grew up in just outside of New York City. I just moved here from Chicago. I've been making my way out or as quickly as I could because the West Coast is the best coast. There you go. But boy, do we have highways out here. Now, there are a lot of highways. I drove like on four different highways to get here today. And, and highways, uh, they're, they're intended to end at a destination, right? They have a beginning and an end. And we're on a Great Commission highway that began 2,000 years ago when Jesus told his disciples to make disciples. And it continues as you continue to tell the good news of the gospel to show and share the love of Jesus. Let me tell you about where Donna and I encountered that. We, we used to live in Chicago, which is a remarkably cold place. It got down to minus 27 degrees, not wind chill, actual temperature a few years ago. And that's actually colder than a legalist's heart. <laughs> if you're wondering if you should be offended by that, they might need some soul searching for that one right there. And so it was February one year, and I was going down to Fort Lauderdale to speak at an event. And Donna, my wife, because it's February, and Fort Lauderdale, she said, I'm coming too. So I called the Uber, and the Uber driver was on her way. The app said her name, was, her name was Jane. So we waited for Jane inside. It was pretty cold, and Jane pulled up. And when we got there, she had the car warm. She, she called me Ed. She asked Donna's name. You know, my name's on the app. She said, um, she said Ed and Donna, uh, come on in. Uh, grab a seat. We got in, and she said, I got, electrical, uh, I got power plugs if you want to charge your phone. There's bottles of water in the seat behind you. And take anything you want from the basket between the seats. Now, right on the floor there, there was a little basket with some candy in it and a strategically and obviously placed New Testament of the Bible. So I knew something was about to be afoot. So I, Don and I at that point had been married uh, over 30 years and it appears at the 30 year mark, you something clicks and you can have entire conversations without using lips or vocal cords, <laughs> simply by looking at one another. So I looked at her and I somehow expressed, let's have a little fun with this Let's not tell her necessarily, you know, who we are, what we do, and let's just run with this for a while. And I had this whole, just by the look in my eyes, Donna understood me. She looked back and she said, okay, Ed Stetzer, but I know you. Do not take this too far. <laughs> so we started driving to O'Hare Airport, and Jane starts asking questions. Well, where are you from? And I said, I'm from New York City. Donna's Canadian. She's from Canada. And, and that's great. It said, well, do you guys have any kids? We shared about our kids, and we, asked, we told her about them, asked about her kids. Um, she, she asked, um, you know, what brought you to town? I said, well, I, I took a new job here and I moved here a few years ago. And, and she asked, well, what do you do? And I, I, I had to be quickly ready to pivot away from that question. So I said, I'm a teacher. What do you do? And uh, she said she was a realtor when she's uh, not driving Uber. And, but in February, January and February, no one's buying houses in Chicago land. And so she, uh, she would drive uh, Uber because she liked to meet people. I said, oh, great. So anyway, the conversation went on. And eventually, Jane kept leading us to spiritual things, most of which I could and did redirect. But finally, she said, so Ed and Donna, do you guys have any like religious upbringing or any spiritual beliefs in your life? And at this point, it was kind of trapped, right? So Donna looked at me and without using lips or vocal cords, said with her eyes, you need to stop this young man. You have to tell her. <laughs> and so I said, Jane, yes, we, we actually do. Jane, you know, Jane, I'm actually a professor. Uh, I teach at, at the Wheaton College and I, I teach evangelism and, and you are doing so great right now at evangelism. <laughs> <coughs> And we laughed, and, and I said, Jane, can I record an interview with you right now? I took out my phone, turned on voice memo, and I talked to Jane, and, and, I said, and she explained to me that she actually um, doesn't, she does fine as a realtor. She actually sold her house about seven months ago. She said, but I just wanted to meet people so I have the opportunity to start conversations about Jesus with people that otherwise I wouldn't have. And Jane knew she was on a Great Commission highway. And somebody told her and somebody told that person and she took up the task to tell someone else. She said, Ed, are you saying we all need to, to start driving Uber and telling people about Jesus? Well, first, that's not the worst thing you could do. But all of us have to acknowledge that we have been reconciled by God and given the ministry and message of reconciliation. And Jane chose to do that, well, by driving Uber and meeting people. So we got to the airport, we flew down to Fort Lauderdale and that next morning, you woke up seeing the news that I saw around the world that Billy Graham had died. 
And uh, all living presidents took some action to go to the Capitol or to the funeral. And fast forward over a week later, we gathered there in North Carolina for Mr. Graham's funeral. I bet you watched at least part of it. It was broadcast on cable news. It was on the radio. A, a friend of mine and I did the voice of the radio, if you listened on the radio. Um, and afterwards, reporters would ask questions. It was very appropriate for them to do so. So after the funeral was over, a reporter from the New York Times came up to me. Their name is Lori. And I got to know some of the reporters because I, I, I want, when they, when they have questions about evangelicals, I want them to be able to call somebody and can actually talk through some of those things with them. And so I knew Lori. And she came up and she said, Dr. Stetzer, and I laughed, and she said, yeah, well, you've got to make it official. Um, but she said, um, she asked the normal questions. You know, how do you think Billy Graham would be received today? What's his greatest legacy? And then she asked the question that everybody asks. Here's what she said. She said, um, she said Ed, who's the next Billy Graham? And nobody in the family says that they're the next Billy Graham. Nobody in the world should make that claim as a unique man that God used in unique ways. I bet, I bet some of your lives or your parents or your grandparents' lives were impacted by Mr. Graham's ministry. But I was ready for the question. She said, Ed, who's the next Billy Graham? And I said, let me tell you, it's Jane the Uber driver. And by the way, that interview that I did with Jane the Uber driver, you can find if you look online, it got picked up all over the place. And don't, don't do it during the sermon, but you can remember it for later. Well, you see, and I said to her, it's Jane, the Uber driver, and she smiled and said, what do you mean? And I told her the story. She said, it's a great story, but it's not making the New York Times. I understood. But you see, here's the deal. Jane was on a Great Commission highway, but so was Mr. Graham, because he says somebody told him. He points to Mordecai Ham, and somebody told Mordecai Ham, and somebody told that person, someone called that person. So Billy Graham and Jane, the Uber driver, both, well, they were reconciled by God through Christ and given the ministry of reconciliation. Now the question then is, what does that mean for us? And I just want to say to you that you too, as a follower of Jesus, if you've been transformed by the power of the gospel, if you've been given new life, you've got a new way of looking, a new set of gospel lenses through which we see the world, but you're on a Great Commission highway, your church is on a Great Commission highway, your missional community is on a Great Commission highway, and I just want to say to you, don't let your life be a cul-de-sac on God's Great Commission highway. And right now, we're going into a Christmas season. You've already heard a call to be engaged and involved in missional communities. What a great way to be on the mission of reconciliation. Number one, we get a new perspective. Number two, sent on a mission of reconciliation. Number three, representing Jesus and his kingdom. Representing Jesus and his kingdom. Goes on and it says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. I should tell you that that's actually not referring directly to you or to me. That's actually Paul defending his apostleship. We don't have time to unpack so much of what 2 Corinthians is doing, but he's speaking of himself and this group of missionaries that he's with, and he says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now, um, Christians have actually used the word ambassador to describe themselves for a very long time. Uh, they've used the word embassy um, in such a diverse, multi-ethnic, multinational church as you have here, which might I also say is remarkably unusual statistically, and what an encouragement what God has done here at Lake Avenue. But some of you who are of African background, maybe recent African immigrants, second, third generation, you know that often churches in Africa will use the word embassy to describe themselves, and other countries, other continents as well. And why? Because we see ourselves as ambassadors for Christ. We're representing Jesus and his kingdom today. So in the midst of all the turbulence and tumult, we represent Jesus and his kingdom. Why? Because Jesus tells us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided to you. The kingdom actually arrived when the king came, and his reign is made clear and made known as we are transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son, and then we join Jesus on mission in the world, making it more as he would want it to be. The word ambassador is only used twice in our English Bible. It is, we'll use once here, and also in Ephesians chapter 6. In Ephesians chapter 6, where it says this. It says, pray for me that the message may be given to me when I open my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. Sounds great. For I am an ambassador in chains. So as we represent Jesus and his kingdom, we represent Jesus and his kingdom in times that 
Sometimes they're easier and sometimes they're more challenging, right? Sometimes we come from places where it's harder and we're in places where it's easier. Sometimes we came from eras where it's easier and now we're in places where it's harder. And the reality is in the midst of the tumult and the turbulence, God is still at work. And actually, historically, in times of tumult and turbulence is when God seems to be at work in unique and powerful ways. The last cultural convulsion we walked through was probably in the late 60s. And some of you might have a living memory of the late 60s as teenagers. And if you remember, 1968 was perhaps the peak of the last cultural convulsion. Most of us don't have a living memory of that time. But if you do, you remember it was like the world was on fire. Everything was pulling apart. There, was, there were protests and there were and there was division. It felt like the, the country wasn't going to stay together. And it was probably, and most people would say, worse than it is today. And in 1968, uh, not far from here, a, a pastor said to his daughter, I'd like to meet a hippie. I heard some of these hippies are becoming Christians. And that daughter brought home a hippie. And that pastor and that hippie started a Bible study together. And it grew to hundreds and then thousands and then tens of thousands of people. And they started coffee shops and communes. It was the 70s by then. And many of us trace, including me, trace our spiritual heritage to that Jesus people movement that began. That pastor's name was Chuck Smith. That hippie was named Lonnie Frisbee. But they trace their spiritual heritage to the Jesus people movement, which we often forget happened the last time it felt the country was pulling apart. So now here's the thing. You say, Ed, are you discouraged by the cultural moment? It's going to be difficult. It's going to be challenging I, in some ways. But I'm always encouraged because in part I've read the end of the book. I know Jesus wins. Yet right now, we can represent Jesus and his kingdom in a more challenging time. Paul says we're ambassadors for Christ. He says elsewhere that he's an ambassador in chains. So in hard times and in good times, we represent Jesus and his kingdom. Let's remember where we are. Number one, we get a, we get a new perspective. We've got a new life connected to a new way of looking, a new set of lenses through which we see the world. Number two, we're sent on a mission of reconciliation. We've been reconciled, now we're on a ministry of reconciliation, showing and sharing the love of Jesus in a broken and hurting world, not letting our lives be a cul-de-sac on God's great commission highway. Number three, representing Jesus and his kingdom as ambassadors in this broken and divided world. And number four, and finally, and I'll close with this. You know what it means when a guest speaker says, I'll close with this, by the way? Absolutely nothing, but let's give it a shot anyway. Number four, and finally, because of the cross. It says this, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is, brothers, this is a passage rich with doctrinal truth about how our sin was deposited in Christ and his righteousness, therefore, deposited in us. So when God looks at you as a follower of Jesus, he doesn't see your sin or your foolishness. He sees Jesus' righteousness. And yet here we remember the passage like Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Sisters and brothers, I want you not to miss this because everything builds on this high point of theology, right? This beautiful picture of what Jesus has done on the cross for our sin and in our place. So he dies on the cross. He died a sinner's death. He himself never sinned, but he died a sinner's death in our place. And now we walk in his grace and in his forgiveness. Well, what does that have to do with the rest of the passage, which is about how we see others and it's about reconciling, being an agent of reconciliation to others, which is about being an ambassador or pointing to being an ambassador and representing Jesus to others. Here's why. Because when you understand what Jesus has done on the cross for your sin and in your place, it is the motivation and the mobilization to live on mission in the world. Because I want you to get involved in missional community zones. I want you to be involved in those. I want you to join Jesus on mission in this community and around the world as Lake Avenue has always been known for. I want you to do all those things, but you will do all those things. And already you saw pa Pastor Matthew talk about it. You'll do all those things in gratitude when you understand what God has done through Christ and what Jesus has done on the cross for your sin and in your place. And flowing from that gratitude will we'll get a new perspective. We've got a new life, a new way of looking, a new set of lenses through which we see the world. We'll live on a mission of reconciliation, right? Not letting our lives be a cul-de-sac on God's great commission highway, representing Jesus and his kingdom because 
of our gratitude for what God has done through Christ on the cross. Would you bow your heads with me and let's pray together and ask God's grace to respond to what he has for us today. Father, thank you by, that by your grace and your goodness you've redeemed us and called us by name. You've sent us on mission for your name's sake. And Lord, I thank you that this church has been on mission for decade upon decade upon decade. I thank you for the influence, the disproportionate gospel influence that has been here. And Father, I pray that you might continue to work exceeding abundantly beyond all we might ask or think through Lake Avenue. Father, I pray that we'd also apply this individually and personally. So take just a moment with your head bowed and your eyes closed and maybe you might think about what it means to to have a new way of looking at others. We get a new perspective. And maybe your life has been kind of caught up in the talk radio anger or the social media vitriol and Jesus is calling you to a different way. Could you say today, Lord, help me to see people around me with the love and grace that you have for them. Could you take just a moment and see yourself as being on this mission of reconciliation? Not letting your life be a cul-de-sac on a great commission highway. Think about your neighbors, your friends, your coworkers, your family. You've been reconciled. What does it mean to be a messenger with the message of reconciliation? How might you represent Jesus in his kingdom? But we do so ultimately because of what Jesus has done on the cross. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, work in our lives so we might join you in and on mission. For it's in Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. Amen and amen.